can say it. There's no doubt about it. Granite City, once again, number one. We never honestly thought about not winning. We, we were quite sure, somehow, we would probably end up winning. Granite City, Illinois. Soccer. The city and the word are synonymous. 25 state qualifying teams. 18 top four finishes, 11 state titles, hundreds of collegiate standouts, numerous All-Americans and professional players. But every story has to start somewhere, and the dominant soccer program in Granite City started with one man. As far as starting soccer in Granite City, it all, it all goes to one person. Ruben Mendoza. Ruben Mendoza. Ruben Mendoza. Ruben Mendoza. Ruben Mendoza. There were other people who would say, this person or that person for father of Granite City Soccer, it's Ruben. Everybody who grew up back then played for Ruben. When you think of soccer in Granite City, you got to start with Ruben. He started the YMCA program. I grew up with the YMCA program. I mean, that's where everybody played uh, back then. So, and then I had a chance to play on uh, Ruben's teams. Uh, when I was a little bit older. What kind of passion did Ruben have for the game? It was his life. He loved it so much. He learned how to play in Mexico and he brought all those skills here and so he was very much in demand when he found out about soccer in St. Louis. Kids would call by the school kick the Ruben because they were the only person who ever The saw Mendoza, them. it was known as the Mendoza. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought that was... Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, back then, obviously, it was probably pretty much of a novelty to see someone uh, back then do that in a game, and uh, evidently it was something that just came natural to Ruben uh, with the ability that he had. So, uh, you know, whenever he did execute it or do it in a game, uh, not too many back then were doing it, so it was referred to as the Mendoza. He, he brought us up. He, he did it all on his own, all for himself, and for ourselves, rather, all by himself. And uh, he, was, he took his time, his money, his efforts, uh, he was he was the uh, he was excellent. He was he was a teacher. Uh, uh, he, was, he was everything that, that that soccer needed at the time. Ruben, I mean, he he did everything for us. He he always had shoes. He always had shin guards. He he came up with the shirts. He ran a sporting goods store, uh, but he picked us up in the morning. We'd, um, 11 ups would pile in a station wagon and take off over to St. Louis. Before Soccer for Fun came along, mm -hmm. he would get um, a bunch of us together and we'd play pickup games out at the uh, warehouse. Mm -hmm. The warehouse is at the Army Depot. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the wintertime it was cold, it was dimly lit, concrete floors, and you had to watch where you were going because there's steel columns that you'd run into. <laughs> what kind of coach was he like? Ruben. He was so knowledgeable and so humble about everything. You got to realize he was on three Olympic teams, two World Cup teams, and uh, I know when he took me out that first practice, and I didn't have any equipment or anything. Well, what Ruben used to do, he used to carry all kinds of used equipment in the trunk of a car, and I know I never, I can't, I don't remember a station wagon with some of the other guys I've never mentioned it. I remember that first practice I went to, he popped open the trunk of his car and it was just loaded with shin guards and shoes, basically. And uh, he said, here, this pair looks like it'll fit you. <laughs> he would pick us up, he would, he would take us home, he would, uh, first time I ever had a White Castle, because of Burger Chef and that guy, because he would take us from the game over and, and actually buy our White Castles and stuff, you know, and so he was, he was a father figure, for sure, and he, he treated us like kids, you know, I mean, we were all, all, we all loved him, we all, we all respected him, not because he was stern at me, because he showed a lot of love for us. He was, in fact, our, uh, our father of soccer. How did it start? Was there like, was it just kind of randomly you walked in one day and they were like, hey, you want to be a soccer coach? Or had they, like, there were there plans to be a soccer team and everybody kind of knew? There, there was plans for a soccer team and they announced that there was going to be a soccer team. The way I found out, I came to school one day and uh, congratulations. And I said, well, what? And they said, uh, your kid's soccer coach. And I says, no, you're kidding. And they says, uh, I said, I haven't applied for no job. 
and they said, well, you've been, you were hired last night in a board meeting. And I said, oh, well, I guess somebody will talk to me today about it, I guess. <laughs> were the guys on the team, were they all soccer players? Well, they had been through the Mendoza, uh, yeah, Mendoza mm -hmm. uh, program. A lot of them had, but a lot of the kids had never struck a soccer ball. I think we all understood we had a hard task in front of us, and uh, I think we all accepted that. We, we went out there with great expectations, but we went out there also knowing that we were just starting, that we had to learn. Plus, they had a coach that uh, didn't have experience, and, and, and I had experience of coaching and, and teaching young men how to compete, but I didn't have the skill level of a, of a, of a coach that uh, could actually perform for them. <laughs> In 1972, the IHSA held the first soccer state tournament. Led by coach John Selmeyer, Granite City lifted the first state title, beating New Trier West 2-1. All those winning soccer teams, state champions, were kids that came up through the program having been coached by Ruben at one time or another. Even if he wasn't the coach of the team, he would go and help them. And he taught the coaches. Many of them had never played soccer. But he had help from people like uh, Willie Syme, Gerhard Moss, mm -hmm guys who grew up playing soccer in Germany, and um, they helped out because they loved the game too. In 1973, Grant City opened the second high school, Grant City North. Gene Baker and Bob Kehoe both were convinced by Ruben Mendoza to coach the two programs. Bob Kehoe probably has forgotten more soccer than anybody else in this country knows, and yet he was he was a gentleman, he was, he loved to coach, he was always very animated on the side, he, he was always coaching like this, his hands were always like this. When you'd interview him, he'd get out and he would say, he would talk about defensive positioning and, and this like this, and just, you know, trying to demonstrate it. You know, Bob had been a former coach of the U.S. national team, the Olymp you know, he played Olympic soccer. Uh, but his, his planning, his tactics were just second to none. Coached the old NASL Stars, St. Louis Stars, and he was a, a phenomenal player, unbelievable soccer player. And he played, uh, he played professional baseball too, but he uh, chose soccer was his favorite. One I'll never forget, he said, soccer is the greatest sport in the world for instant experts. If you find a parent whose kid has played one half of a peewee game, they know everything. And he said, if there's ever a day goes by that I don't learn something about this game, it's probably been a bad day. When they opened North, uh, Selmeyer had just stepped down to, be, to go back to teaching, and they brought in Kehoe and they brought in Baker, and which one was gonna get the new school, and Bob wanted the new one. He said, I wanna take a you know, team from scratch, you know, start a whole new thing, and I don't think, Gene says it didn't matter to him, whichever one they wanted him to coach. And, you know, that's the way it worked out. I was young and thought I knew a lot. Um, I found out very quickly I didn't know what I thought I did. And so the 10 years um, at North under Bob, that was, that was uh, real education. And I'm glad I had a chance to do that. Gene ran his program like, like a college program. It's kind of like, you know, there's some other schools that you could maybe mention today that do that, the successful ones. Um, he was fair, but he got what he, but he knew what he wanted. Uh, if you didn't get playing time, it's because you didn't deserve it. It wasn't, you know, he, was, he taught um, tactics. And he, he knew the people at the lower levels and he knew that the kids coming in didn't have to be taught how to trap. They didn't need to be taught, you know, how to, how to plant your plant foot before you pass a ball. And then it was like, hey, you know what you're doing when you get here. We can talk about, you know, we do tactics, drills. I, you know, I used to co coach club. I got so many drills from Gene. Poise in the box, I'll never forget that. And different, you know, he, he knew, he knew what, it, what it meant to this town and still does. His style, um, you know, he 
he broke it. He broke it down in, into everything. It didn't matter if it was the beginning of the game. It was free kicks. It was corner kicks, long throw-ins. I mean, he was very, very detailed in in every part of the game, and I think that's why he was so successful. They had a lot of similar characteristics: their knowledge of the game and tactics and uh, training. Both of them, and that's probably one of the biggest things I learned is preparation. In some ways, their style, their coaching styles were were similar. Um, and you know, I don't know if I could tell you which ways they were different, but you know, but for both of them, their players obviously were very, you know, they they really liked them, and uh, you know, played hard for them, and uh, had great respect. So you know, those were those were things. Those were more things that you know. I think prepped me to to be a better coach. A good crowd at a high school soccer game now is at most a few hundred people. But what if there was a game that attracted thousands? A game the whole city stopped to watch. The rivalry between Granite City North versus Granite City South was something out of a movie. Two great programs, two legendary coaches in one city in the middle of it all. And it wasn't just soccer that they were North and South were rivals. That they were rivals in everything not just sports, everything. You know, it was like a dividing line. Are you North people or are you South people? It's kind of like, you know, they say St. Louis, where'd you go to high school? In Granite it was, are you North people or are you South people? Granite City North people used to get tired of hearing, well, North's the second best. Granite City's got the top two teams in the state. South is first and North is second. North got tired of hearing that, I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah, I mean, there were big rival games. It was huge, I mean, we had, few thousand people who oh, came yeah. out to the games <laughs> all the time. I mean, it was a battle. And, uh, you know, it was kind of neat because back then when you grew up playing in the YMCA leagues when you were in grade school, uh, you know, I played with a lot of guys who ended up going to North and a few of us went to South. So, you know, you started playing against those guys uh, when you reached high school. And uh, they had great teams. They had good players. I mean, Granite City in general just had good players. So uh, both schools were very fortunate. Well, I was on the, the, when I graduated in 74, that was the first year of Granite South, so that was the first South-North game. Mm -hmm. So our junior year, we're all playing together. Our senior year, we're playing against each other, and that game was held out in the middle of Forest Park. So it wasn't even on school grounds, and they just drew the, the field lines, put up a couple goal posts, and that game had people, it seemed like 15 people deep all the way around the field. It was so loud, you could barely hear the ref blow the whistle, even if he was standing right next to you. It was just so electrically charged, it was it was a great game. When it came down to, you know, state playoff time, it was always between North and South pretty much to determine who was gonna move on. It might have been 74 or 75. Um, we hosted, I don't know if it was a regional game or a sectional game, but it was a championship and it was between North and South and it was on the soccer field out at North and um, there were 5,000 people around the field. And there were no lights at that time, here or out at North. Most, most games that went to PKs, which happened a lot, were done at, at dusk. I mean, you could barely see. Uh, they would bring in off-duty um, policemen for extra security because people in the stands would take offense <laughs> to, the, to each other. Oh man, yeah, especially the Grant City South and North rivalry, the Collinsville games, there was, you know, it seemed like thousands of people, you know, out there, the stands were packed, there's people lined up two or three deep around the field. Uh, so yeah, that was, it was a neat environment. What was the atmosphere like at games whenever you were coaching? Because I know- oh, we had big crowds, <laughs> monster crowds. You've heard that? Oh yeah. yeah. I've, I've um, heard stories. I brought it to that field and not, not the field here that you play on now, the yeah. baseball field. Yeah. Uh, when I left, they changed that. I had a certain identity on that field um, that you couldn't win here. It was a fortress. You know, yeah, we were um, we were unbeatable here practically, and it was because of the crowd, uh, because we worked out here and familiarity with the field. Uh, I I did that intentionally. Did you start calling it the gauntlet, or yeah, how did you... I named it? How did that come about? Did you just... I'm an English teacher. Things like that hit me. And, yeah, the gauntlet, you know what the idea of the gauntlet is. Yeah, you have to run the gauntlet. Yeah. 
and the, the white man was never said to be able to make it. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea. Now, a lot of other people would blame the size of the field. It wasn't small. Uh, they'd have all kinds of things to blame, but we worked hard here and we had, um, so we had the crowds and then we would have drummers come out all the time, bring the team out. We had a great atmosphere. It's hard to describe, to be honest, um, unless you were there. And, and I know that sounds probably kind of corny or whatever, but it was, it was especially back when we had the, the gauntlet um, with the, the little Cracker Jack box that we played in. And you had the stands on one side that were, you know, six, seven feet off the field and the fence that was about three feet off the field on the other side. So it was literally like you were surrounded by either the fence or the fans or um, whatever. The atmosphere was, was incredible. The outfield of the baseball field, man, that was the gauntlet. I don't know what the overall record was when the, when all the teams played on that field, but you know, if you did your research, I would find the, I'm sure you would find that was a pretty pretty good record. Oh, yeah. Not too many teams came here and uh, left with a with a win. The field spoke for itself. <laughs> um, the name of the field, the gauntlet. <laughs> I think people came in scared, even to step foot on the on the on our pitch. You know, and I think that's how we took it. It was our pitch, and uh, you know, we weren't gonna we weren't gonna give up points on in the gauntlet, and uh, um, you know, student section, parent section. It was it was packed every game, and that's uh, you know, it was wild and crazy crazy atmosphere, and and you know, running out and through the through the cheerleaders and the pom poms and all that. It was uh, it was pretty cool. It was it was a really cool atmosphere. I miss it. Granite City North was an incredible program that could have challenged for a state title every year. However, the Steelers were not alone in Granite City, and their incredible teams were eclipsed by one of the most dominant teams in Illinois soccer in Granite City South. Granite City South High School won five state championships in a row. From 1976 to 1980, South didn't just dominate Granite City and the surrounding area. They dominated soccer in the state of Illinois. And one man was at the heart of it all, Gene Baker. So when those teams started winning all the tournaments, they started calling Granite City, uh, calling the state tournament the Granite City Invitational, because they knew there was going to be a Granite City team there. I remember being up at one of the state tournaments, I think it was a Palatine friend, standing in the, the press box near a guy who was on the board of directors of IHSA. He was I think a principal at one of the schools in the Chicago area. In, in, South was kicking somebody's butt, and it may, it may have been his school, I don't know. And he just said under his breath, and he didn't know I heard him, he goes, God, Granite, would you give somebody else a chance? Just give somebody else a chance for once. You know, five straight years win a state championship, that's amazing. I changed the culture here, which was, it should become a real sport. It's not a kick around Park Alley game. It's Get in shape. It's uh, tactics. Uh, the biggest thing that I did, frankly, that unless you played here for me, that a lot of people wouldn't understand, is I prepared. Every practice was prepared. So I could class from I taught English. Every uh, every practice, every game, prepared. I loved preparing for games. I really enjoyed that. I miss it. That's one of the things that we had going here too was, um, and it helped me was um, having families of brothers and our sisters who would play for the same coach, there was trust. So you didn't have to go through the second guessing routine that a lot of coaches go through. My idea was after so many years, uh, somebody would say to their son or daughter, go play for him, he cares about you, don't come back with any squawks. I'm getting mistreated, I'm cheated, I'm better than this, they're not, take, they're not uh, playing me and I'm better than everybody, all that kind of thing. They'd say, he'll take care of you, go work. And uh, it was a nice way to coach. I started the midnight practice. We would kick off the season with a midnight practice, charge to get in, which was an automatic, easy fundraiser to help with things in the program. And the practice, would, I had it run for exactly, uh, the lights were on for an hour and a half. Bang, 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 everybody. Everybody would tend to be in shape for that first practice. Why? Everybody's gonna be there. Parents are gonna be there. 
You don't want to get sick in front of them because you're not in shape, you know? And so it, it was fun. And you wanted to show them something of what they go through. Um, and the idea, the basic um, theme philosophy was that um, we w want to be the last one on the field in the state of Illinois by winning the state championship. Now we want to be the first one on the field to start our season the next year. But we felt we could, we could win it all the time. I'm not one who says we're going to win it. Everybody says, oh, you have to think that way. I'd have to correct the parents to say, that's not the way we do it. We do it if, if we prepare, we can win. Well, we've got to come prepared. We have to compete, <clears throat> and then we can win. Uh, it comes with it. My whole deal in coming here and my, my concept of coaching at Blackburn or Riverview or here or wherever is that I try to t teach the game, um, teach competitive edge um, along with humanistic values. That's been my whole, and I feel I really enjoy trying to go get scholarships for kids to help their future. So you check that. If they were willing to come to the practice and work their fannies off for me and for the program and behave in such a way, that's what made it a real sport instead of an alley game. And uh, if you could do that, then I felt I needed to do something for you, and I would go hard. I would work hard. Now, having played uh, at the national level, not that I was the best player in the world, um, I knew people, and I could call them and say, "Hey, Brian, I haven't seen you for a couple of years. I know you're at this particular college. I, I need to place a kid. Can you take care of him for me?" And I'll, what I would do is tell them, "This guy has these skills. Um, he has. Uh, he's this kind of student as well." Um, uh, take him for me. If he doesn't work out, don't come back for more. And I never did so many bad ones. You, you always knew that uh, Coach was going to be prepared. He always scouted the other teams. He had, he had given us like a lesson plan. Uh, he expected us to know that lesson, you know, that he presented to us. Uh, he gave us scouting sheets on teams. Um, so we would have like a little quiz, you know, before matches, you know, who's, who do we think their best player is? Uh, what number does this player wear? What number does that player wear? Is he right footed? Is he left footed? Uh, what's his uh, strength? What his weaknesses? And that was always part of our game plan. And we, and we always had to know that, you know, we all figured that if he was going to be that prepared, we need to be that prepared too. Uh, so that if he called us out in a meeting, you know, we knew what we were talking about. So, uh, I, coach was one of the things I got from Coach is that he was extremely prepared for each and every game and for each and every practice that we had. He had a unique style of how to motivate each individual player. Um, he could pick out what would motivate you, what would motivate me, and that's what he would hone in on. Uh, and I didn't realize it at the time, but you know, when you step away from it, and you, you get a little older, and you see what's going on. He had a unique ability to tap into what motivated each individual person and then bring them together as a team to um, uh, play together. Because I mean, one guy can't win a game by himself. It's, it takes everybody, all 11. He knew the game inside and out. It seemed like um, he had the feeling your team was never going to get outsmarted or outcoached because Gene was on top of it and ahead of everybody, including the refs. Um, with the tactics, the strategy, whatever, being able to read a game, uh, you had full faith and confidence in Gene being able to lead the team. Uh, that was pretty neat because that, you know, that was he was probably the best coach that uh, that we had uh, going up to that time. And then even going off to college to play soccer, uh, thinking that okay, we're going to college, it's going to be that much harder than high school. And guys like Gary Hinsey and I training and being ready for it. And, finding out our college training wasn't as, as tough as what we'd been through in high school, or so it seemed. One thing, Gene, you said you talked about Gene's preparation. On his way to state every year, they would always stop along the way somewhere where there was an AstroTurf field and he made arrangements for them to have a practice session, work out on the turf. Um, in those days, SIUE 
didn't have a turf field, but they had a big AstroTurf patch near the near Kelker Field that that uh, they let them go out and practice on because they could get used to the way the ball acts on turf because it's totally different. You know, things just come to mind about how prepared he was. No, no trick was ever missed. Coach Baker. Uh, was pretty much a, a coach who, you know, you dealt with the moment. Uh, you know, previous teams, teams change every year. Uh, and especially that team, that from my freshman year to my yeah. sophomore year, having that many seniors, influential seniors and starters leave a program, I mean, there were a lot of holes to fill uh, that next season in 78. And coach Baker was, again, uh, someone who you know, you had to deal with the moment, this game. He was very day-to-day -day kind of guy and, and, you know, always prepared us that way. You know the Sigma be on Yes. Tony, you know, and you know, Tony is his son. Um, they became, they were sort of like a Sigma Biano um, referee mafia, sort of. They were all, they all ref, you know, together. But I remember a game, it was up here, I just watched, it came to watch a game. Granite was by our Granite was playing maybe Collinsville. I played on the football field, so when the girls played on the football field here. And um, Gene was great with refs. He would uh, he would bait them. I mean, he was great. You, know, you see basketball coaches do that. Yeah. He was good too. And I remember he called out one time that Rich said to be on. He thought he had missed a call. And he was kind of having a bad game. You know, refs have bad games. He yelled out. And it was one of those moments that it's kind of quiet where you can hear everything <laughs> he said. And he says, Rich, why don't you pretend it's a real game this time? And ref like it's a real soccer game. And sometimes Gene would get away with stuff like that. And I know Mel was always there with the boys team to take the cards for him. He said, that's part of my job. I gotta take cards for the coach. <laughs> Grand City continued producing great players and teams into the 90s and 2000s. Many players have gone on to play professionally in the US and in Europe and become innovative coaches at many levels. In 1984, after the two schools had been combined, the program added a girls soccer team that became incredibly successful even adding a state title of their own in 2011 under Coach Birdsong. The biggest thing they did is they figured out they were playing for each other, not themselves. Um, we had a little incident up in Burlington, Iowa, at a tournament that um, ended with some midnight jogging. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, from there, the, the team seemed to pull together and, and really start to, to figure some things out. I personally prefer, prefer um, high school over club stuff just because um, there's something special about playing for your school and, and for your community and um, with the folks you go to school with every day and have grown up with for the most part that sort of thing. Taking nothing away from club soccer or anything uh -huh. else, it's 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 fine for what it is. But to me, and I'm I always say this, I'm very biased. But um, my experience with high school athletics, both as a player and as a coach, there's there's something there that you don't get <clears throat> other places. I never got it after after high school, even in college or anything else I've done. Um, and so it's something special. I think the biggest thing that helped when I transitioned into the head coach of the girls is those girls that were juniors and seniors the, the two years that I was the head coach, um, they had been with me since they were freshmen. And so they had kind of heard, you know, the same things. I, I didn't, you obviously treat boys and girls differently yeah. to some <laughs> level, but but not, not what I expected on the field, their effort or, mm -hmm. you know, the way to go about doing this the right way, uh, as Coach Bake always used to say, and, and uh, you know, Coach Bunning and Coach Ames, um, that's still the same. And so that approach was, was always the same. And, and we were hard on the girls, but they also know that we were, we were on their side. We were always gonna have their back. Lots of conversations before and after practice, during the day at school, um, you know, different individual one-on-one -on -one things, groups, those kinds of things. But, um, when we're when it's time to step on the field and practice or play, especially, you, you better bring everything you got, no matter what else is going on. And so, in that regard, um, I, I didn't really think it was much different. It, it obviously is, but um, we we held the girls to a pretty high standard and expected them to get there. On Christmas Eve, the carpool that I rode with used to meet in the lounge in that, or the cafe actually, in that hotel where he was a barber, and wait until everybody got off work, because on Christmas Eve, it was sporadic what time people got off. 
So we would meet there, and when everybody arrived, we'd, then we'd leave. So we were in there waiting, and a man from the telephone company was teasing us about meeting men and how we should be more aggressive. And some of the other girls were saying, we can't do that. You can get away with it, uh, but we can't. And I said, why not? I would do it. He told us that he would say, no offense, but you're about the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And he said, while she was catching her breath, I would sit down. And so I said, I would do that. And they said, no, you wouldn't, no, you wouldn't. I said, okay. I told Mr. Moore, go get that good looking barber. <laughs> and I'll say it. So he brought him over and another guy and he managed to seat him right next to me. And so I said that. <laughs> and true enough, it kind of made him catch his breath. So that was the beginning. One of the best things for me, it's kind of a funny story, the CBC, which I considered the best soccer program in the area. We played them and we tied them. And Horrigan was the name of the coach at CBC. He got mad at one of his players. And the player, he told him to give him his uniform. He said, the you know, player said, I'll turn it in tomorrow, coach. And he said, no, I want your uniform right now. He says, you didn't play very well against these uh, kids that we just played. And so, I was pretty proud that our kids played who I thought was the best team in the area and competed with them, and not only competed with them, but scored with them and also you know, come out of advantage. So that was probably my happiest moment in the soccer program. And I think a lot of people didn't know what soccer was at that time. So we didn't get too many crowds anywhere, and it was cold. I remember Rick Lesko. Uh, Rick would start sweating during the game, as cold as it was, and then he would end up with icicles. So he had long sideburns, <laughs> and he'd have icicles on his <laughs> sideburns at the end of the game or during the game and stuff. So I mean, that's kind of the weather we played. Uh, Assumption one time, I remember. I believe it was a Saturday morning game. It was three degrees and a light snow. And Coach Rirosti came in the locker room and said, you guys can wear one pair of shorts, your game shorts, a pair of socks, your game socks, one sweatshirt, and your game jersey. No hats, no gloves. <laughs> and that was a cold day, I'll tell you, especially, of course, I remember I played the whole game, but the, the poor guys that were on a sideline, what you had for a warm-up was the cross country, which is that real thin stuff. Yeah, it's not, and then, not much for that kind of weather. <laughs> I've, I've played stuff so, like that. But it was a lot of, a lot of time we had to play, and it was just darn right really, really cold, you know. I mean, after our very first game, I mean, Coach came onto the bus, and he yelled and screamed at us. And I mean, he, so we each received nicknames that day. You know, he would, like me, I, I remember what he yelled at me. I don't remember what he yelled at everybody else, but he yelled at me and told me I looked like a peanut <laughs> rolling around in the middle of a bunch of elephants because his guys were knocking, knocking us all over the place. But um, So, I mean, those were the kind of things that, that were fun. The most enlightening thing about it was when um, playing in this kind of weather, we wore football jerseys the first, the first year. And uh, so we'd come to practice and we'd be bundled up. I mean, we would have hats and sweatshirts and long pants and different things but when it came to game time coach made it very specific from the beginning that you got to wear one shirt underneath your jersey no pants you had to have your shorts on and, and no hat so i mean that's what we played in whether it was 50 degrees or whether it was five below zero i mean it didn't matter and it was cold my senior year uh, we played Collinsville, it was back in what they call the Bowl. That's right off of Main Street. It's kind of a sunken thing. Was home? Uh, they're Collinsville's home Collins, game. Okay. And uh, we're down there playing. Um, and I remember Dave Sheridan, breakaway after breakaway after breakaway, just getting chopped down in the penalty box and the refs wouldn't call it. Well, um, game got out of control, fight started, full field brawl. 
both benches cleared. Um, it just it was not pretty, and the refs had to call the game. Uh, so they load us on the bus. We're driving out, and um, and even the cheerleaders from Collinsville were throwing rocks and uh, stuff. So it, uh, it was it was bad. Yeah. So that kind of got the Collinsville Granite thing started, um, and then just kind of went downhill from there. Uh, what's interesting though is that you know I mentioned I refed. Um, years later, and I was very proud of the fact that um, Collinsville would call me and Hague Negotian, knowing we're both from Granite, knowing that I played for Baker, to come referee their home games when they're playing against Granite, and Granite would do the same. Uh, so that went on for a number of years, and so I felt that was, I was very proud of that, mm -hmm. being, uh, knew the game, could call a good game and be objective, and, and them knowing where I came from. But when we first uh, were looking to move the, to Granite, uh, Mom and Dad started looking at houses, and they found a house on the north side of Pontoon Beach Road, which was the dividing line for yeah. who went to north and who went to south. And they were looking to purchase the house. We were still living in Fairmont at the time when they were doing that. But uh, they found a house north of uh, Pontoon Beach. I think they were looking to purchase it. Uh, in the process of buying the house and looking to find a move-in date and a closing time back then, the gentleman who was living in that house at that time committed suicide in the house. Oh. So, uh, needless to say, my mom and dad uh, were that's, no longer interested in the house. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back then, my mom didn't sleep much as it was, yeah, so he, uh, she didn't want this guy's ghost lingering around and being on her mind, so they had to look elsewhere. Yeah. And they eventually found a house right down the road from here and uh, eventually the house I grew up in and it was on the south side so that's how my brother and I ended up going to south rather than north back then. Wow. So funny story. So all the time. Uh, did fate play a part? Who knows? I'd like to think it did. Mill was a guy who he didn't have a soccer background either. He was a good teacher. He was a good coach. Uh, he could inspire these kids. He was funny as he could be. And my son was a toddler, four years old. Uh, we lived in Collinsville. We would go to Kayhawk games just because you want to watch soccer. And whenever uh, Granite was playing Collinsville, we'd go, and Mel would sit my son on his lap, and he would say, purple, bad, bad. <laughs> to this day, my son remembers. He's 34 years old. He remembers, oh, yeah, purple's bad, purple's bad. Red, good, purple, bad. I went to Louisville for about a year and a half and played a little, played a little soccer, and that was under Fernandez. Um, he was the, he was our coach in uh, Louisville for the Louisville Thoroughbreds, and uh, there was, there was some college, college buddies of mine from Indiana and, and some other local schools that all played. We had a decent team, um, traveled, traveled probably all over the, you know, Midwest and, and East Coast uh, to play games, and then I just got a call one day from. Uh, from an agent in uh, Germany and said, hey, you know, you want to play? Uh, <laughs> meet me in Chicago on Friday. And, and I think that was like Wednesday or Thursday. And uh, so I met him on Friday and I tried out, kicked it around. And he said, I got a plane ticket for you on Monday. So it was, you know, two days I packed my stuff and I was, I was on a plane to Germany. She had this giant, like Sam's jar of peanut butter. And it wasn't open, and so I'm trying to open it, and I couldn't get, like, it didn't fit under the can opener, and so I'm getting, like, a screwdriver or something. And finally, I get a corner of it pried up, and I think I'll just pull the lid off. So I slice my finger open, um, go to the hospital, get stitches, don't get to go to the first game. <laughs> Next game rolls around, I'm like, I'm playing, I don't, you know, I'm playing. So coach puts me in. Um, this was against... Uh, against Vianney. Actually, that was the last game before the strike. So we had two games, and then we went on strike for one or some other. So puts me in, and I probably played about 30 seconds, and it ran around so much in that 30 seconds that I was like I just ran the Boston Marathon. I mean, it, I was just because of what you just said. You just, you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, and I, I mean, I played a million games before that, and it's not any different. It's still the same game you've always played, but there's something about those first times that you step on, they're like, holy cow. So um, I remember the coach took me right back out not too long after that. He's like, you got to slow down a little bit. I, 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 don't worry, I will. I got it. I'm not doing that ever again because it was crazy. But I did. I was like everywhere. And then, 
Oh boy. Wow, we, that's only 30 seconds. That'd be great. <laughs> so it was, it was fun. Well, how about if I throw a couple things out there? Uh, one, I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, give credit to John Selmeyer mm -hmm. that when he was, he knew he was going to be moving on as coach, that he insisted, uh, well, he wasn't going to move on unless they hired a good quality coach. So I'd like to thank John Selmeyer mm -hmm. for that commitment to the program. Uh, and they couldn't have done better with getting the guy they did with, with Gene Baker. Um, and then I'd like to say thanks to, to Gene Baker because at the time you think you're just playing soccer, you're having a good time. Uh, what you don't realize is how it's preparing you for the real world that um, you're going to put, you're going to work hard, you're going to practice hard um, because that's how you're going to play is how you practice and to take that serious. You're gonna learn that sometimes the ball doesn't bounce your way and you're gonna lose games you shouldn't lose and you're gonna win games you shouldn't win. Uh, and boy, I saw that repeated in, in life and in business so many times too. Um, it's also gonna tell you that um, it's gonna teach you tenacity. You just gotta grit your teeth and, and run through it even though it looks like you shouldn't. I mean, that's just like playing a game, um, your best player gets red carded you know, you still have the will to win and, and the desire and the commitment to, to beat the other team even though you're down. It's like, and to me that all came from soccer and then it just transferred over into life. Uh, and I'm forever grateful for that. Why have you stayed with the game so long? I mean, have you not gotten burnt out? I mean, yeah, it, it, it's a passion, you know, it's a, it's, it's a love. Um, my family loves it. We wake up Saturday mornings and sometimes my wife's got the soccer game on watching the game. My daughter and my son does too. So it's just a love for the game. You know, I, I can never see myself getting away from it. Um, you know, when I retire from teaching, um, you know, obviously I might have to step away from the high school scene, but um, I hope I'm still around the game in some way or fashion, some form or fashion. You get to just be like my dad and sit at home and watch it every day. Well, yeah, hey, you know, we record <laughs> it, we watch it, you know, and I think you learn, you know, you learn from that. You know, it's not just always watch. Sometimes you sit down to watch a good game, you know, just to enjoy it. But sometimes you watch it to, you know, find formation changes, you know, how's Arsenal change their lineup for Chelsea, you know, versus Man U and things like that. So I think that's just the coach in you. Um, but uh, maybe I'll get to sit down and relax and just watch more games and not find myself doing that. But um, I enjoy it. I love the game. Uh, I love being around the kids and, you know, I, I hope I, you know, can do it for the next five or six years before I retire.